Good evening. So today we will start our last um, unit, an introductory section on vector fields. This uh, introductory section is, uh, well, very introductive. We're just going to spend some time on defining this concept, paying attention to some notations, representation, and also make sure you watch, uh, even more important, the second part of the lecture, which is on Maple, because as you will see, some of the, I mean, the the way to represent these functions are, is better than obviously with technology rather than by hand. But again, the careful definition on paper and some some visualization with the pencil and paper is still important, in my opinion. So uh, the most general type of function, right? So that means the input of the function is going to be a uh, uh, one or more variables, let's say x, y in the 2D plane in the, in the two-dimensional system or three variables or more. And the output of the function, as the name implies, is going to be a vector. So um, in general, and by the way, you can generalize this quite a lot. I mean, in terms of, uh, for example, I mean, you can have um, vector fields taking um, the input from uh, 2D and then giving you a vector in 3D. But in general, we're going to deal with two types of vector fields. The one defined in R2, in the two-dimensional coordinate system. And then the notation for a vector field, usually to keep up with the notation in the homework as well, um, it's with a capital letter with a bar on the top. Again, to emphasize that the output of that function is going to be a vector. Input, like I said, in this case is just x, y, two variables. Uh, and then the output, since it's a vector, but it's going to depend on x and y, the components of that vector will be dependent on x and y themselves. As with any function, the output depends on the input. So the output is a vector. The vector has some components. In this case, um, two components. And then each component, which remember is a real number, each component on its own is a real number. Each component depends on x and y. So that means in defining um, a vector field, we make use of functions of several variables. <clears throat> because of this, and let's actually define one in R3 as well. That in that case, obviously, we have three variables as an input and the output will be three components, all of them depending on x, y, and z. And to make this distinction, when do we talk about the output being a vector and when do we talk about the output being a scalar, sometimes you can see this terminology in this section or in various books. If you have a function, an old fa I mean a function of several variables that returns a real number, this is sometimes called a scalar field. If it's a function that returns a vector, again corresponding to the same input, that's what we're talking about today, right? A vector field. This is also important because you will see that there are the integrals which we can define both for scalar fields that is for function of several variables or for vector fields. Same type of integral. I'm not talking about the multiple integral we, we, we studied before, but for example, the concept of a line integral, which is defined on a curve. There are actually two types of line integrals. One that is integrating a scalar field, that is to say a function of several variables, and another one of vector field. And the meaning, the physical meaning, of course, will be different in, in those cases. Let's actually um, talk about a default example that we should have in mind for a vector field. Not the only possible example, but the one that you, it's nice to have in mind because it's easy to visualize. <clears throat> so let's talk about, for instance, the most general one, right? The three-dimensional vector field. Let's say uh, you have I'm not going to sketch anything here because just try to visualize. Let's say you have basically a, uh, a fluid. Uh, 
or a flow of water or any fluid for that matter, right? And at any point in the fluid, in this flow of water, which again can be three dimensional, right? So think about the body, a uh, river, for instance, right? The, um, the river that flows, let's say, through a region of space. Then at any point, I mean, any point on the river can have a uh, location, right? A, co a geographical location given by the three coordinates in space, depending on how you actually define that or how you um, uh, set up that coordinate system. And at that location, is you're going to have, um, the fluid is going to have a velocity, which is going to be a vector depending on that point. So this could be the velocity of the fluid or the water at that point. So if you want to have a function that takes as an input the location, the ge geographical location in that body of water, and you want the output to tell you, let's say, where that portion of the water at that point goes and how fast it goes, you obviously need a vector to represent that. But that changes from point to point, unless, of course, the flow is extremely regular, right? But in general, um, you know, the flow can be quite um, erratic, right? You can have a whirlpool, a whirlpool um, and then again, flowing in various directions as you move from point to point. But again, this visualization of a fluid uh, or a velocity field, if you want, I think it's useful. Or a force field, I think that's also easier to imagine. Let's say you basically that, um, you know, you have a, an object um, or you have a force field in some, some enclosure, wherever you, you are at that point, uh, in that enclosure, at any point, again, identified by the geographical coordinates X, Y, Z, um, there's a force acting on that object. That force would have a magnitude and a direction, so hence, uh, the output is going to be a vector. Now, let's see how it's uh, how we represent this. The representation of a vector field is actually quite straightforward because all you have to do is basically pick a, a point in the domain and then decide to uh, basically compute the vector at that point returned by the vector field and then sketch it. So we're going to just do two, three examples. I mean, one example, but with two, three points to sketch. And then we're going to move on um, after that to the, um, to the maple demonstration, right? So let's say you have a vector field, again, in two dimension, because it's easy to sketch, given by the components x minus y, uh, x plus y. And let's, with the two column here, let's pick a sample of three points. Let's say I want to evaluate the function at one one, it at minus one one, and at uh, let's say two one. <clears throat> so if I plug in one one, that's going to be zero two. If I plug in minus one one, that's minus one minus one for y, that's minus two and then minus one plus one is zero. And at two one, two minus one is one. And then um, two plus one is three. So <clears throat> let's sketch this uh, to the best of our abilities. Again, we're not gonna do everything at scale here. So a vector field node is actually can be represented quite I mean, there is a default graph of the vector field, if you think about, which is not the case, for example, for a function of, let's say, three variables, because you have the domain occupying the three-dimensional space, and then the fourth value of the function doesn't, doesn't fit there. But here, you have room for the whole domain, both in 2D or 3D, and because the output is a vector, you can just sketch the vector at that point. So basically, the, the default graph of a vector field, well, as the name implies, it's a field full of vectors, right? I mean, the number of them you want to plot depends on the application. So that's why technology is important here because it can easily show you hundreds of vectors coming from that vector field. And then you have an overall idea um, of the properties of that field to go back to the fluid dynamics. 
example, you're going to have an um, overall visualization how the water goes and how fast, where it goes and how fast. Picking sample randomly won't do the trick. I hope you, you guys see that. So for example, let's see, at 1, 1, let's say this is the point 1, 1. The corresponding vector is 0, 2. So starting from the point here at 1, 1, I'm going to measure um, two units uh, vertically, right? Because the, um, let's actually use a different color, because the, um, the x component is 0. So if the s component is zero, obviously all the vectors are vertical. Uh, next, um, at minus one, one. So if x is minus one and y is one over there, the vector uh, that is given by this function is minus two, zero. So it's gonna be horizontal because the y component is zero. And just as long as the previous one, but to the left. <clears throat> and then finally, let's do the one at 2, 1. x equals 2, y equals 1. And at that point, the vector given by the function is 1, 3. So I'm going to measure one unit to the right and three units up. Like that. And this is the vector corresponding to that point. <clears throat> so this is just a small sample. And that's the extent of it we're going to do by hand. Far more important is actually to associate, let's say, a vector field that you will see on Maple with the correct function. You're going to have some matching uh, functions with vector fields given on uh, in the picture, uh, in the homework. Or... Uh, even more importantly, if I look at the function, uh, I mean, at the vector field mathematically, I should anticipate, if possible, some properties of the graphical representation of that vector field as a check to see, uh, you know, so to speak. And then we can confirm with, with Maple. So let's uh, do a second page on paper uh, and then um, to see how much we can actually tell about how the vector field looks like. And then we're going to move on to Maple example. So stay tuned for my uh, for the next page. Okay, so how much can we tell about the uh, shape of a vector overall shape of a vector field just uh, using paper, pencils, and uh, mathematics we know so far? So. Notice when I say that each component can depend on x, y, and z, they don't have to. I mean, some of the components can depend on um, one variable, so it can be a constant. So let's look at a couple of examples. So let's say f of x, y, this is a two-dimensional vector field. Let's say it's given by, um, uh, by x, and let's say x plus 2. So notice that these vectors only change uh, with respect to x, which means that since they don't change with respect to y, they are going to be stacked, so to speak, on top of each other. That is to say, if I only change the y coordinate, in this vector field, I should see the same vector. So I hope it's pretty clear what we're talking about, right? So for instance, let's sketch the vector at the point 1, 1. x equals 1, y equals 1. Uh, so f at 1, 1, that's going to be 1 and 3. So I have to move 1 over uh, and 3 up, right? So let's say this is the vector in question. But if I do, if I evaluate the vector at, let's say, 1, 2, since the uh, vector field itself doesn't depend on y, that's going to be again 1, 3, nothing changes. So if I move y, I'm going to see the same vector parallel to this. You know, on any vertical line, I should see the same vector. They change as you as x changes, right? So for example, if, um, if I evaluate the, you know, f of, let's say, 0, uh, 1, if x is 0, then the vector is z two, 0, 2. So at the point x equals 0, the vector is vertical 
but it's going to be the same as you move. That's not a good example, probably. So it doesn't matter which, which Y you pick, it's going to be the same vertical vector, two units up from there for any point. So just by noticing that the vector field doesn't depend on Y, we already can anticipate that the flow is going to be unchanged as Y varies. So again, to use the analogy notation, the analogy with the fluid dynamics, flow is unchanged if Y changes. <clears throat> and of course, analogously, if it depends on Y only. Um, here's another very simple thing, right? I mean, what if, let's say, let's say have a 3D vector field in which f of x, y, z is 1, I don't know, 0, uh, 3. I'm not going to sketch this one, but clearly this is the equivalent of a constant function. If I look at the vector field, I should see the same vector uh, for every... Uh, position x y z for any input in the in the actual function. Um, what about slightly not more complicated but just different, right? What if um, what if the vector field is given by let's say um, x y and three? This doesn't depend on z. Right? So the Z component is 3. So that means all vectors are oriented up. I'm going to use this in quotation marks, 3 units. So the vectors themselves change because X and Y changes. This is hard to actually sketch by hand, but try to visualize it and uh, just, uh, just make sure you watch the second part when I'm going to show these vectors with Maple. But what I'm saying is that no matter the magnitude of the vectors, which changes with respect to x and y, and of course the x and y components changes as well, change as well, all of them have the same thing in common, which is the third component is three is equal to three, z equals three. So all of them basically are up oriented upward by three units along the z axis. Uh, let me see if I have another one that I want. Yeah, here's another one. Uh, that we can again anticipate and I'm gonna sketch with maple what if you have two constant components let's say one two and z so the z varies but uh, the x and the y components are the same these vectors are stretched along the z-axis because the z component increases with z but if I look from above uh, from above, if you imagine the z-axis, the positive z-axis is the upward orientation from our perspective, then I should see um, the same vector in x and y, which is 1 and 2. Because again, if I see from above, I hide it essentially the effect of the z-coordinate. And since the x and the y-coordinate are the same, then from above, I should see essentially the same vector. And again, that, that uh, helps you to visualize the correct vector field if you do a matching problem, so to speak. Once again, this is completely or nearly completely meaningless if, we don't, if you don't watch the second part. So just, just try to imagine how it looks like. And then once the, when this part is done, run the uh, or watch the second part with a, a maple demonstration. Finally, before we move on to that maple demonstration, a very important type of vector field is the so-called gradient field. So let's write it as a definition here. The gradient field, well, as the name implies, is the um, field, the vector field, which is the gradient of some function of a function of a several variables or a scalar field if we if we use the alternative uh, name for it and it's very important because 
I hope you remember the meaning of the gradient at any point. It will tell you the direction of the greatest change. So let's put things, these things together, right? So we start with a scalar field. Okay, so let's say, you know, let's denote that by f of x, y, right? The scalar field in, in 2D. It doesn't matter, it could be in 3D, it's the same idea. From a scalar field, remember this is a real number, right? Because uh, f of x, y is a function of several variables. From the scalar field, we can construct the gradient of f, which is a vector given by the partial derivatives, fx, fy. But this is a vector field on its own. So it follows the description of a vector field, but it's a particular type of vector field. It comes from a scalar field, right? I mean, it's the gradient of the scalar field, which is uh, which is a vector field like any other. Well, it's a special vector field because it's attached to little f of x, y. So therefore, this is go going to be the gradient field of f of x, y. What is the meaning of it or why, what is it good for? Well, for lots of things, but among which is it indicates the direction of the greatest change. So if I pick a point x, y on the domain, remember the gradient as a vector field at that point indicates the direction of the maximum change of f, you know, the maximum of the directional derivative at that point. And notice that we don't need to put the uh, vector notation on the top because we have this inverted delta, right, which is the which is the symbol for the gradient, and by definition, the gradient is a vector. Uh, so, as an example, which I'm going to show you uh, with Maple, let's say, let's say my vector, uh, the scalar field, let's say square root of x squared plus y squared. From this, we can construct the gradient field, which is partial x, partial y. Partial x is, let's see, 2x over 2 times the radical, so that's x over the square root of x squared plus y squared. And then partial y, which is y over square root of x squared plus y squared. <clears throat> and a very useful map you're going to see with Maple as well is to plot so it's a very, a very useful thing to do is to plot the contour plot of the scalar field. Contour plot, remember, follows the curves of a given value. It's a way of representing the value of a function of several variables together with the gradient field. In the same coordinate system because it will show you a sample of possible values of the scalar field itself and it will show you the direction of the greatest change of those values okay so for example a weather map it'll be very useful to show these two things let's say the isobars will be you know the level curves of the of a given pressure air pressure and then the gradient field, for example, it'll show you the direction of the pressure differential and then, you know, what the greatest pressure differential. So it'll tell you, for example, the direction of the, um, um, you know, strongest wind from that point, right? So um, with that being said, uh, that's it for the paper uh, or, you know, the pencil and paper part. And let's move on to the... Um, maple demonstration of all of these examples. I'll see you next time.